they uh, devalued the rupee by 24%. Much criticism of Dr. Manmohan Singh. For some reason, people wrongly tend to think that the strength of the currency uh, uh, automatically translates into a strength of the economy. But I used to argue that, look, it's true that a strong economy, because it generates a hell of a lot of import exports, will end up with an appreciating currency because more people will want to get into the act and currency will appreciate. But if, it, if its economy is not strong and you make the currency strong, you're actually weakening the economy. So the idea that a strong economy leads to a strong currency is true, but that a weak economy should prop up a currency which is not strong is a bad idea. As Montek said, they've done a fair amount of liberalization, but there's a lot of underlying stuff there that hasn't been handled. For example, uh, as Asimoglu and Robinson would say, the institutional setup still remains the same. Um, as some would say, India has not opened out enough, or has it opened out enough? Then the other thing that we see from Pakistan's experience, even though we open up enough, the bureaucrats dream up a new set of regulations. So we've got this NOC culture where they give NOCs for 10,000 things, which operates like a license. So all this is happening. So Jit, what's your take on this? I believe um, somewhere in Italy, um, presenting the World Development Report in 91, and I got a telegram from Montec. And the telegram said, the devaluation has happened. So this is part of one, you know, it was tinkering, but I think what set in place, and I really have treasured that telegram. In those days, you didn't have email and so on and so forth. You actually had those good old fashioned telegrams. And so what happened was that, um, you know, I have treasured it. And that was the start, as Montek has explained, that was the start of non-tinkerization and structural reforms. Um, and, you know, very important emphasis that Montek has made and conclusion that Montek has made is that there has been extreme amount of continuity in reforms, regardless of the government in power. And I think that's a lesson for any other country, uh, democratic country, wanting to institute reforms is, uh, you know, this continuity. Welcome to the PID webinar. Today is a special delight because today we are beginning our series where we will talk to India directly on Zoom and learn from the Indians and have a cross-border dialogue even though we can wait for relations to normalize. But I think we can continue to talk at least economics, forget politics, we'll talk about that. But it is an especial pleasure because we've got Monte Galuvalia. I think everybody knows the name Monte Galuvalia. He's a man who's contributed significantly to the to economic policy and in, in, in the world. He has been the India's um, finance, finance secretary as well as deputy chair of the planning commission. He's the man most associated with the um, design of the policy reform that happened in '91, and thereafter he's been um, at the center of many things in India that have happened. Right. So we're going to hear, hear directly from him as to what the story was. I know in Pakistan. We put out a lot of theories, and uh, which is good, which is great. This is great for the conversation. But I think it would be great to hear from Montek directly. So I'll ask Montek to speak on two or three things. One is the liberalization, the historical fact, what happened. And two is how did that story continue? And how? And after that, what is, what is it that has underpinned the Indian growth, uh, now sustained growth of 7% for almost 20 plus years? Uh, so it's a big agenda, but I think he's the right man to hear from. And then, of course, with him, we have Sujit Palla, who's also one of the finest. I mean, these two guys are one of the finest economists and the two of the finest economists in the world. And I think they will both um, a uh, shed great light on the story and b I think there will be a bit of a discussion between them two that will also allow us to parse out the Indian story. And ultimately, what we want to learn is how can we you know, also make our reform happen in Pakistan. So with that introduction, Monte Galwali, as you all know, has been not only in great positions in India, but also in the World Bank. He was also 
being a director, a very senior position in the, in the IMF, and he's been in many world stages. So, Montega, thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, to be here. And with that, I'll hand the mic over to you. So, over to you, Montega. Uh, thank you very much, Nalin. Great pleasure to be here and kick off this dialogue. I think we do need to know what is happening in neighboring countries. Uh, it has a lot more relevance to each of us than perhaps we think. You know, let me just say uh, I agree with the proposition that the reforms introduced in 1991 were pretty fundamental. I think in the previous decade of the 1980s, there was a recognition in India that, you know, our policies were not actually leading to the results that we had hoped they would lead to. And there were some small changes made. I think Sujit Bala uh, will remember him. I remember him describing these changes as tinkering rather than fundamentally altering the structure. And I think he was right. You know, uh, I had the uh, privilege of being uh, in the office of uh, Rajiv Gandhi when he was prime minister. And, you know, a young man comes to, into power, brings in fresh ideas of making India ready for the 21st century. And one of the things he said when he went into parliament, his more or less first statement on parliament, is that how can we compete with other countries when we are using systems that are 20 years out of date? Now, this was the first time that a prime minister of India had ever said that there's something wrong with our systems. I was quite encouraged that we were then going to see systemic reforms, but actually that didn't happen. I won't go into why it didn't happen, uh, but what we saw was incremental change. So if you like, uh, Rajiv Gandhi was not able to implement the systemic change that he himself had talked about. And obviously politics was an important part of that. But around 1991, we ran into a very uh, a set of circumstances that was conducive to rethinking. First of all, the deficiencies of the old system, excessive control over industry, excessive control of the private sector, suspicion of the private sector, uh, clear preferences for the public sector, uh, uh, ad negative attitude to both foreign technology and foreign direct investment. I mean, these things were known to be the problem. But what happened was that in 1990, we ran into a series of economic constraints, partly triggered really by the uh, uh, American, uh, the Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, the US reaction to that, the huge increase in oil prices that took place. And this is happening after one year of political instability in India because the Rajiv Gandhi government went out of office in 1989. Then you brought in a different government which was cobbled together, no strong, no strong party with a credible majority. That government managed to do some things, but mainly it was preoccupied with holding pieces together. Um, VP Singh, who was the prime minister at the time, went to Malaysia. You know, he used to visit Malaysia in 1973, and I was part of the delegation. And you know, very often when prime ministers visit abroad, you get a chance to talk to them informally in a way in which you wouldn't, and they also use that opportunity. And this was the Commonwealth um, heads, heads of government meeting in Malaysia. And he said to me that, you know, Kuala Lumpur looks really developed, whereas when I used to come here in the 19, 1970s, it was quite a provincial town. And I said to him, sir, that's exactly my view, because I used to come here for the World Bank in the early 1970s, and I remember it being a very provincial town. So he said, well, why do you think that has happened? And I said it's happened because they have undertaken fundamental economic reforms, which we have not done. So he said, well, why don't you write me a paper on what needs to be done? Well, anyway, that paper did get written. It got discussed. And it tried to pull together the fact that you can't make changes by asking every ministry, uh, what do you need to do to achieve your objectives if the basic structure is not right? You need to have if you like, a cross-ministerial view on what is it that you're going to change. Some individual ministries like, let's say, 
the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, in those days, we used to have something called an export subsidy scheme and a marketing oh, subsidy podcast. scheme. And if you if you ask the Commerce Ministry, how can we get a better get a view on exports? The answer would be we need more subsidies. We need more market support. The answer would not be that we can't upgrade the quality of our product because you don't allow uh, freedom of investment. You don't allow foreign direct investment. You don't allow foreign technology. You don't allow a free exchange rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think the paper I wrote, which leaked, it was written for internal discussion. It leaked later on in the press. And I mean, most people knew that I had written it, uh, but I would, of course, not confirm that. And I think it was Ashok Desai who said that this paper was written by Monte Galwalia, but he's not confirming it. So let's call it the M document. So that's how the name M document came uh, to stick. I would say that if it made four or five points, those points were, number one, the world's changing. Wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, the East Europeans had already given up communism. Soviet Union was still alive and communist. It collapsed. Communism in the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of 1991. But mostly uh, the countries had gone non-communist, non pro-private sector, much more open. China was uh, beginning to forge ahead, and Deng Xiaoping had made very clear signals that we need systemic change. He brought in the, I don't care whether a cat uh, is uh, white or black, as long as it catches mice. Sort of a practical test of results. And I think every country uh, was liberalizing and opening up. I think it's also true at that point that the world was doing quite well. You know, those who talked about globalization uh, described the global economy as doing quite well. I mean, you remember that uh, uh, Huntington or something, at, well, you know, his famous statement that uh, end of history, etc. That was a triumphalist declaration that now everything is known. There won't be any more uncertainties uh, and the world is going to march ahead confidently. There was a very strong uh, global consensus that this is the way to go. And the dominant power at that time, unchallenged, was the United States. And they were, in fact, conducting themselves in a manner which supported a market, global market economy. I mean, they allowed, they encouraged China to come into the market and basically kept the, kept the playing field reasonably level. So in that environment, uh, we had a series of crises. The government fell, uh, loss of confidence, uh, Indians who used to bring money into, into India stopped doing so. Uh, we have, we, just as you at, the, at your worst ended up with two weeks worth of reserves, worth of imports and reserves, that's exactly what we got to also. So I think the difference then was at that point, uh, there was an election, a new government came in. It was a government headed by Narasimha Rao. Congress led government, but still a, 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 a coalition government. And they had the good sense to put Dr. Manmohan Singh as the finance minister, recognizing that we have a major economic problem and we've got to fix things. Now, Dr. Singh later told me that he had read the M document earlier. And, you know, he, with Mr. Rao, managed to persuade everybody that we need to move in that direction. So what did we do? Number one, big changes in the industrial investment control regime. Uh, large areas where industrial licensing was removed. People were allowed to invest if they wanted to invest. People were allowed to expand if they wanted to expand. I mean, earlier, if you had a license to produce scooters and you wanted to expand more than 25%, you needed specific government permission. That was all got rid of. Uh, <clears throat> foreign investment allowed more freely, not completely freely, but more freely into a large number of sectors. I think the most important thing was abolishing import licenses for a vast majority of goods. You know, earlier licenses were given to people who were, consumers got no licenses, producers got licenses to import things if they could persuade the government that the domestic product is not good enough. So that led to a lot of interface between producers and the uh, import controllers, 
all the usual kind of sources of bribery, etc. Uh, that was got rid of. And along with that, and this was a key, key part of the M document, along with that, the exchange rate was freed. You know, most industry was in favor of getting rid of import licensing, but most of them did not draw the conclusion that if you want to do that, you must free the exchange rate. Because at the old uh, overvalued exchange rate, if you get got rid of licensing, the demand for imports would be huge. So how do you control that demand? Not by reintroducing licensing, but by freeing the exchange rate. The moment the exchange rate then reflects this excess demand, well, those who can pay that exchange rate would import and others wouldn't. And I thought that was a terrific uh, uh, contribution because you know what the, what the reforms did was in the very first two days or so, they uh, devalued the rupee by 24%, much criticism of Dr. Manmohan Singh. For some reason, people wrongly tend to think that the strength of the currency uh, uh, automatically translates into a strength of the economy. But I used to argue that, look, it's true that a strong economy, because it generates a hell of a lot of import exports, will end up with an appreciating currency, because more people will want to get into the act and currency will appreciate. But if, it, if its economy is not strong, and you make the currency strong, you're actually weakening the economy. So the idea that a strong economy leads to a strong currency is true, but that a weak economy should prop up a currency which is not strong is a bad idea. And this wasn't easy to sell. It wasn't easy to sell to politicians. It wasn't easy to sell to the public. And we had a great advantage. The finance minister was a professor of economics and used to explaining things to people in a manner that would not make them feel that he thought they were stupid. So, you know, this, this academic touch of explaining something uh, was a great help in that period. Well, I could go on and on, but basically getting rid of controls, freeing the economy, freeing the exchange rate. But let me say that we didn't do a complete job. I mean, we did not initially, for example, get rid of the, uh, get rid of the small scale industry reservation. That was because the government felt that small scale guys, there are too many of them. We don't want to irritate them. And our policy reserved about 800 items to be produced only in the small scale sector. Now, this was a very silly policy and several government reports, including one by Abid Hussain, had pointed out that, look, these are the sectors where we can do exports, uh, electronics, toys, garments, by reserving them for the small scale sector, you're preventing the development of an Indian industry capable of meeting large export demands. But for whatever reason that continued and that was removed only slowly over a period of time. So I think the, uh, but nevertheless, having said that, uh, there was this major set of reforms. Along with that, we introduced reforms in banking, again, in a gradual kind of way also opened up the capital market. This was a very big issue because, you know, uh, in 1997, when the East Asian crisis broke, there was a continuous, uh, there was a strong feeling that the problem was created by a completely free capital market. And in those days, the IMF used to encourage countries to free up the capital account. Actually, we set up a committee under Tarapur which had my good colleague, good friend and colleague and co-panelist on this occasion, Sujit Bala, on it. Because I said, look, Sujit is the best known advocate of free markets. I know that these guys are not going to recommend free markets. So let us not have a panel which looks as if it's a, a pre-cut to reach a certain solution. Let's put Sujit in there and he'll make sure that the recommendations are balanced. And he did. I mean, they, they, they said we should become free, but we've got to do it in stages. And in the first place, we've got to restore fiscal uh, balance. I mean, if you don't have fiscal balance, then the pressure to suck in money uh, will be too strong at a point when the economy will not be strong enough to absorb it. So, you know, in all these areas, 
uh, the thought of reform, the thought that things have to be done differently uh, got seeded. And then I would say that, <clears throat> that automatically continued in future governments. The Narasimha Rao government ended in 1996. I think the economy did quite well in the initial phases. It was replaced by the United Front government, which had a bit of the old uh, uh, Congress party, uh, many other left-oriented parties, with the Congress outside in opposition. Chidambaram, who was the finance minister, who was the commerce minister under Narasimha Rao, became the finance minister because his part of the party broke away and joined the United Front. But the, the Communist Party of India, not the Communist Party Marxist, but the Communist Party, the more Soviet-oriented party, uh, was a member of the coalition. And they also carried the reforms forward. So that was, to me, quite an interesting uh, demonstration that, you know, uh, it's very important for a developing country to find a way by which politicians can differ strongly with each other in the electoral contest, but at the same time do sensible things which may involve continuity. You know, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government came in immediately after that, and everybody was concerned because they, they had expressed a lot of reservations on various aspects of India's uh, economic reforms. But he made it very plain early in the day that, look, democracy means uh, governments change. It doesn't mean that what is working well uh, will be reversed. I, I mentioned in backstage there was a very interesting visit by, hang on a second, let me. A uh, very interesting visit by a bunch of American uh, representatives and senators or something. Uh, and they called on Mr. Vajpayee. And Mr. Vajpayee asked me, I was then finance secretary under the BJP government, to join in. I was a bit surprised because normally when foreign parties uh, visit the prime minister, it's the prime minister's office which has officials there. But I was asked to come. And I realized why I was asked to come. It's a bit of a compliment that Mr. Vajpayee paid to me because the one thing these guys wanted to know is will the economic liberalization continue? And Mr. Vajpayee was very clear that, look, uh, we fight each other in the political space and there's going to be political change, but whatever is working well is going to continue. And he says, there's Mr. Aluwalia. He was very involved in the liberalization. He represents continuity. I represent change. I mean, it was quite a charming way for a prime minister to put it. But I think the central theme, and, and you know, Mr. Manmohan Singh used to very often discuss what he's going to do with Mr. Vajpayee. And he would find Mr. Vajpayee quite supportive. But in parliament, uh, BJP members would be viciously critical. And so he once went to Mr. Vajpayee and said, look, <clears throat> I discussed all these things. So I, I'm surprised that your party is so uh, still so aggressive. And Mr. Vajpayee said to him, look, you know, if you want to be in politics, you must develop a thicker skin because you can't expect that politicians will not criticize each other. They will. But the test is, what are they actually doing? And I would say that uh, India has done well under the reforms, and I think it's continuing to do well. Like everybody else, we are going through a very, very stressful global situation, which adds a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but I would say that in the broad thrust of things, that is, we must go for fiscal stability. Uh, we are not, uh, we must lower uh, corporate tax rates to create a competitive tax system. Uh, we must develop infrastructure which in India is much poorer than it should be, that we should do this not just through the public sector, but also through the private sector. In all these areas, policy is continuing. I think there are some new initiatives which reflect forward movement, which were thought of by the previous government. Uh, they were not able to get it done. The, the most important is the GST, for example. The highly controversial, 
when the UPA put it forward. Uh, and I mean, the, among the strongest opponents of the GST was uh, the BJP, including Mr. Modi as Chief Minister of uh, Gujarat. But you know, after coming to power, the central government, I mean, it's very good that they said, no, this is the right thing, let's do it. They had the power, they had the majority to get the support. And in this case, the Congress supported them. They didn't say, you opposed us earlier, now we're going to oppose you. So we got the GST done. But as in so many things, <clears throat> the way it could have been done could have been better. Now, that's a technical issue that we can come to. But that's a very good example. And, and the other good example is really the digitalization. You know, one of the big positive things right now about India is the role of digitalization in increasing productivity, in increasing whatever ease of doing business, in allowing fintechs to get into operation, which will help credit to go where it's needed. Now, this whole thing began with the Aadhaar project, the single biometric identity, which was started in 2009 under the UPA government with Nandan Nilakani, drafted in directly from outside. And he did a superb job. I think he covered about 800 million people uh, by the end of the UPA government. At that time, the BJP was opposed to Alhar on the usual privacy ground, whatever. I mean, look, when you're in opposition, you oppose something. And there's always somebody willing to tell you what is wrong. <clears throat> so Yashwan Sinha, who was earlier finance minister, chaired a committee which opposed, which said this Aadhaar bill should not go through. And frankly, we were all a bit kind of concerned. And Nandan Nilakani asked for a meeting with the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, and to explain to him why Aadhaar was good for India. Uh, he got the meeting. Now, remember, Nandan Nilakani had just stood for election in Bangalore as a congressman. And of course, he'd, he'd lost. But the Prime Minister is told Nandan Nilakani wants to see you. So I, I wasn't there, but I can imagine that somebody would have said, who is Nandan Nilakani, a very distinguished technocrat. He was working on Aadhaar, and he was a Congress candidate for Bangalore, and we thrashed him. So, you know, you can imagine that the prime minister might, might say, I don't particularly want to see the guy. He did see him. It was meant to be a 15-minute meeting. It took much longer. And the net result is the BJP changed his view on Aadhaar, and the Aadhaar bill went through, and Aadhaar kept getting expanded. It was in this government that the national payments system was put in place, uh, and a lot of the financial inclusion that started earlier uh, continued. And I would say today, uh, the, the digitalization, its facilitation of financial transactions, the pace at which it, uh, it has expanded, and what it might do for productivity is one of the strengths of India, which many people acknowledge. So it's another good example, I think, of how policies are carried forward. I think there are, there are certain areas where, in my view, there's been an unfortunate reversal. Uh, one of them is in raising customs duties. There was a very strong pressure from industry that our customs duties were too low. Although, you know, the person who succeeded me in, in the new Niti Aayog, Arvind Panagriya, uh, he put out a three-year program about a year after the new government came in. And he categorically said that the customs duties are too high and we should continue the tendency to lower them. And in his uh, public statement since then, he has repeated that, that we should not be raising uh, duties. Now, I think that's sick. That signal coming from Arvind Panagriya is worth much more than the same signal coming from me. But it does give a sense that uh, people are aware that, look, we shouldn't be conned into uh, this protectionist sort of uh, surge, which seems to be go gaining ground around the world. Um, I think one of the big uh, continuities is that the private growth is going to come through the private sector. I mean, that was the view of the UPA, that is the view of the BJP, that is the view of every party. The question is, can we provide a 
facilitating environment that would make the public sector, make the private sector do its job. Now, one of the biggest things there is really the fiscal situation. And the problem with it, and this is not a problem due to any one government. Uh, we have several different state governments, different parties, and each one of them seems to face this problem that the easiest way to get votes these days is to start a welfare program. And it's always done in the, in the best interests of excluded groups, women, the poor, you name it. But in the end, it amounts to a welfare program which is being expanded. Uh, and the problem is that puts a burden on the fiscal situation. And that is going to be very difficult for India right now because we have new challenges that we have to face. I mean, on the one hand, uh, we don't have a particularly happy relationship on the northern border and our defense expenditure actually is quite low. Uh, it almost certainly needs to be increased just to have a reasonable uh, defense position that's going to that's going to demand a certain amount of resources. It's just well known that given the way technology is changing, our research and development from the government is too low. It's also too low from the corporate side. And the government should certainly increase expenditure for research, especially in agriculture, because with climate change, we're going to need a lot more uh, climate stress resilient agriculture. That means doing more in that area. A lot of the climate change related things in energy, which are being done, you know, moving from coal to renewable energy, this is going to require very extensive uh, structural change in the energy sector. Some of it doesn't call, call for money, it calls for policy changes. But a lot of it will involve money. I mean, after all, uh, we are going to be moving to a energy system in which the basic sources of energy are not going to be Bihar and Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh, where all the coal mines are, but they're going to be in Rajasthan and Gujarat and Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu, where the solar and wind energy is. Now, this is going to require a very substantial restructuring of the uh, energy evacuations infrastructure, which, you know, in the long run can get privatized, but in the short run, it'll have to be built by the public sector simply because it's extremely difficult to get land. Uh, and any private sector guy trying to get land would find it very difficult. I mean, for example, I, I was recently at, uh, at, at, uh, at uh, a function in the IIT in Jodhpur. I happen to be in Jodhpur as you can see from this rather luxurious looking room in, in the palace. Uh, and the, the, we discussed climate change. And you know, one of the young women there said, you know, I'm a, I'm a bioscientist and I have a complaint with the government, not the present government, just the government. And her view was that you have classified all of this area as wasteland. And other people say, if it's wasteland, then let's put solar farms there. But the fact is, this is a unique biosphere. It's not a wasteland. And if you just do too much solar stuff, you will be disturbing this biosphere. And you know, one of the issues that the great Indian bustard sort of exists, it's a threatened species. And a lot of these guys are objecting very strongly to overhead wires evacuating solar electricity uh, because it affects the bustard who for some reason isn't a very good aviation navigator and keeps bumping into wires. So they want the wires to be underground. Now all this is going to add money. So I think from the fiscal side, India, India's fiscal deficit in, in Pakistan, you have a similar problem. India's fiscal deficit is at the moment too high. The big advantage that India has is that we can take a bit of time over it because the underlying growth rate seems to be reasonably strong. I mean, most people think that we will grow at six plus percent uh, over the next few years. Government is, of course, wanting to be more ambitious and take us to seven, seven plus and so on. But at six plus percent, you can sustain uh, a, a, a fiscal deficit for a little bit longer, uh, consistent with getting back uh, to fiscal stability. 
But clearly that has to be on the agenda for India. I mean, the other thing, by the way, is that, you know, we've got through the, the low hanging fruits of reforms. I mean, earlier we were just doing a lot of things which were quite stupid. And once we agreed that we don't have to do them, it was relatively easy to get rid of them. We took longer to get rid of them, but we got rid of them. Now, I think we are working, looking at a world where technology is introducing altogether new types of changes, will require new types of regulation. And in a globally integrated world, we can't be inventing our own regulation. So we've got to have, we have, we've got to have a say in the global evolution of regulation on e-commerce as well as on artificial intelligence in a manner that uh, looks after our interests. And the same thing would be true of other developing countries. So I think the design of economic reforms is now much, much more challenging. It's not relatively obvious. Uh, and increasingly what's happening uh, globally is that you're getting a trade block, of China on one side, the Americans, Europeans, uh, should the Indians run their own trade block? Not sensible in my view. Obviously, ideally, we would like to trade with everybody. That has been our traditional approach, which is quite sensible. But, you know, you might get pushed a little more uh, towards one rather than the other. <clears throat> the choice, choosing between the Americans and the Europeans on issues of e-commerce and digital transactions is a very genuine choice. And there are issues there in the sense that the Americans claim that the Europeans are unduly restrictive, which is why their productivity growth is so low. And that if you, move, if you go that way, you will also suffer. So I think these are choices that need to be debated uh, much more than have been done so far. And I'll stop at that point because I'm sure you have questions you'd like to raise. So anyway, it's, a, it's going to be a fun time for everybody. Thank you very much, Montek. That is wonderful. Let me bring in Surjit. Surjit, Montek mentioned that you called the reform tinkering. And in some sense, from our discussions in the past, it is tinkering because, as, uh, as Montek said, they've done a fair amount of liberalization, but there's a lot of underlying stuff there that hasn't been handled. For example, uh, as as Muglu and Robinson would say, the institutional setup still remains the same. Um, as some would say, India has not opened out enough, or has it opened out enough? Then the other thing that we see from Pakistan's experience, even though we open up enough, the bureaucrats dream up a new set of regulations. So we've got this NOC culture where they give NOCs for 10,000 things, which operates like a license. So all this is happening. So Jit, what's your take on this situation? Thank you, Nadeem. And, you know, after the tour de force by Montague, I'm not sure I can add too much, but let me point out some of the differences, you know, and uh, some things that didn't get done um, and that needed to be done. But yeah, absolutely right, you know, Nadeem, you and I and Montague, uh, not with the, uh, all three at the same time, but have been discussing these issues now for something like 40, 50 years. <laughs> so it's a long time. Um, what I would say is that, look, uh, you know, and I remember um, I was in, um, I believe, um, somewhere in Italy um, presenting the World Development Report in 91. And I got a telegram from Montec. And the telegram said, the devaluation has happened. So this is part of one, you know, it was tinkering, but I think what's set in place, and I really have treasured that telegram. In those days, you didn't have email and so on and so forth. You actually had those good old-fashioned telegrams. And so what happened was that, um, you know, I have treasured it. And that was the start, as Montek has explained, that was the start of non-tinkerization and structural reforms. Um, and, you know, very important emphasis that Montague has made and uh, conclusion that Montague has uh, made is that there has been extreme amount of continuity in reforms, regardless of the government in power. And I think that's a lesson for any other country 
a democratic country wanting to institute reforms is uh, you know this continuity now there are you know what didn't happen and before and i'll i'll come to what has been happening over the last 10 years which is different than what happened before uh also the reforms but of a different nature or different emphasis and partly because the global situation has changed over time from uh, those good old days in uh, 1991 uh you know the one reform that the one take one take of the government uh, the congress government did not institute in 1991 was agriculture and this was a much needed reform and indeed um by expanding the pds system making agriculture further uncompetitive um i think that was a a huge setback uh to the growth process i'm no, sorry to interrupt uh, what is pds what is pds a public distribution system where the government has an elaborate network where they will buy from the farmers and then give to the uh to the poor people um so there was a lot of leakage in the public distribution system in the past a lot of leakage is a euphemism for corruption uh where the the people who should have been getting the the food grains did not get it and it was you know sent to liquor companies and so on and so forth huge huge uh corruption and um, then what happened when the bjp government took over um the basically instituted um this um <coughs> public distribution system to transfers and this is where aadhaar really comes in very very handy that is you are able to reduce corruption you are able to target uh, the people who get it it's still a bad policy in my view but you are able to really redistribute uh, in a much more efficient where efficient is meant to be much less corrupt manner uh, indeed um, studies by uh, international organizations um have shown <coughs> excuse me that targeting is now about 90% so 90% of the people who should be getting the food are actually getting it now so but i want to bring you up to date um in 2020 so this agriculture reform did not take place then in 20 2021 uh montek again features in <laughs> in the reform process and was asked by the punjab government to suggest a reform of the agriculture sector and montek uh, wrote that report suggested certain reforms uh, what should be done and indeed those very same reforms were then suggested and produced by modi as part of the farm laws now this is where now we have while we had cooperation in the past so, so the reforms that montek outlined on agriculture something that the congress government in 91 did not even touch and as i said made worse by its policies now montek offers a solution the government had been working on how to reform the agricultural sector for quite some time i have been been involved in those meetings etc and finally came up and coincidentally at the same time or maybe a few months before a few months after montek's report for the punjab government okay state report uh, recommending how we should liberalize agriculture and what happened there were protests um they were organized by very well organized set of protests and this is where interest groups come in and the reform did not take place that's the bad news the good news is that that in several states agriculture is being reformed along the lines of what uh the government had proposed so this is you know partly where 
unfortunately what has happened um is that you know the congress is now opposed to anything that the government does and it's part of uh, you know you see that in other countries as well where you know it's one thing for the opposition to be in opposition that makes eminent sense to me they are supposed to be in opposition and they're supposed to provide checks and balances on policies uh which is what had happened before but unfortunately now um over the last few years uh this is not the case now in terms of continuity of the forms and the additional reform that has happened uh post prime minister modi coming to power it is a very strong emphasis um on again uh i'll take the cue from montek's book when he was at the world bank uh called redistribution with growth and this is what is you know not well recognized not well appreciated but i think it is beginning to be is that india has really in a remarkable way uh move towards redistribution with growth the growth rates have stayed the same broadly uh there's one caveat there on growth rates and uh, it is that you know and this is often comes up in a political sense which makes eminent sense to me um that look the growth rate under the upa period was faster under the under the manmohan singh government or sonia gandhi manmohan singh government was faster than post 2014 one correction in there so it was faster and i'll tell give you the numbers that india growth 2004 to 2013 was 7.8% per annum very very healthy and the the growth under modi 2014 to 2023 the bjp government is 6.9% per annum so 1% per annum lower <laughs> under the bjp however and this is where the you have to look at it that the upa growth took place under a time when the whole world was growing very fast so you have to control for excess growth and or control for how the rest of the world did and just to conclude that basically the additional the higher excess indian growth during the uh, 2413 was 2.2% and during now 2014 to 2023 is 2.9%. So this is where uh you know in some sense we are achieving growth and obviously there's a lot of data which I can provide evidence that I can provide on redistribution that is happening. So we are in a very you know the policies that are there you know in terms of um import not import licenses but import taxes etc there is legitimacy to what montega said and uh but i think in the big picture um it it, it gets you know subsumed i think the big story in india 2014 to 23 is that growth has been maintained at approximately the same rate uh and excess growth is higher and there is a large amount of redistribution one further element in terms of the forms um and this happened in 2019 uh where corporate tax rates in india were cut to east asian or slightly higher than east asian rates but considerably one of the largest if not the largest uh, corporate tax reform took place in india in 2019 um so i think there was an 8 to 9 percentage point change in the corporate tax rate reduction in corporate taxes in india and we've seen the fruits of that you know in terms of uh extra tax collections i think the the form story in india is not done uh i believe perhaps to the um objection of many people uh that but the evidence is equally strong that indian tax rates are too high okay let me make this clear indian tax rates even now are too high and how do you assess that 
You find out what the tax rates in other countries are, and you find out what the tax rate in India is. And you say that, listen, this is we're being taxed at a very high rate. The middle class is being taxed at a very high rate. So maybe, and this is where I differ from some of the others, maybe that is necessary to finance redistribution. But I believe that, and evidence shows, that reduction in tax rates increases compliance. And that is one of the biggest, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest mistakes people make, that economists make, is to think that, uh, you know, higher tax rates lead to higher revenues. And that is not the case at all. Higher tax rates lead to lower compliance and therefore lower revenues. Um, so I think that is, so the reform process is not complete, but it needs to be done. Last point I would like to make about a problem facing uh, most countries in the world, if not all the countries in the world. And Nadim, you would remember um, this was a, a seminar that I, I, I gave at, at the IMF um, as well as elsewhere based on my book on uh, the new wealth of nations. And I think, you know, what has happened, Montague, you, me, all of us were involved in advocating, and I think correctly advocating, education, aspiration, that really education was the new wealth of, of, of nations. Um, and we all did that. All the countries did that. So what has happened? Basically, the unemployment rate amongst the youth has gone up. Unemployment rate of college educated people has gone up. And, you know, in China, they're not even publishing statistics on unemployment of youth. Uh, but this is not a, a China problem only. This is not an India problem only. Europe, almost every country I know is facing higher unemployment rates amongst educated people than amongst the non-educated people. And this is a, a problem that we need all to uh, face. I would say that in India, um, and part of the redistribution with growth, that the unemployment rates amongst college educated, etc., are one of the lowest in the world. So that's not to say it's, it's not there, but it is to say that this is where we need to get back in a way, and I think India has shown the way uh, of how you can have a basic income uh, to supplement uh, the incomes of the poor. Uh, I, by the poor, I mean really policy is, is the bottom 50%. In Montague's time, in the olden days, it was 40%, but I think 50% is the new norm for who you should tackle uh, in order to, or who you should support. So I would just conclude by saying that, look, it is an amazing story of growth in India for the last 30 or 35 years now, and, and an amazing story continuing uh, for the last 10 years of redistribution and balancing uh, the, the incentives for higher growth versus the fact that you need to redistribute. I think that when history is written, um, this is how the growth process and reforms. And I think, you know, I have no uh, shyness in, in saying or embarrassment in saying, you know, India is a model case of how reforms have, can be done. Uh, have been done and are continuing uh, to be done. I don't thank know you, if I answered all your questions, Nadeem, but basically. No, thank you very much. No, obviously yeah. there are many questions, but we'll, we'll take them up certainly. But let me just quickly begin by asking both of you, and please folks, raise your hands. You're free to ask questions um, very quickly. Um, I have a very simple question. I mean, you tell me that there was a big bang Given the fact that you liberalized certain things, as Montague says, you liberalized the, the, the exchange rate, you liberalized the, the capital account or the current account, I should say, 
Uh, you still have some capital controls, but nevertheless, you've liberalized it dramatically. And you also liberalize the investment regime, especially the industrial investment regime. You left agriculture alone. Um, I'm trying to figure out what we've seen in Pakistan is we did try and do this. But what we saw is that the bureaucracy hit back and put in more controls. So I'm, I'm, I'm surprised to see how is it that the, in, in India, where the Babu Raj is famous, where the bureaucracy is, is the same as ours, probably even worse, they're less liberal than us. How did they not invent? What we have, we have, for example, they've reinvented, as I said, NOCs. For some activities we've seen, there are about 50 NOCs that are required. So you have to go to different babus with a set of files, attested documents, and then more attested documents. And the documents have to be on 100 rupees stamp paper, 200 rupees stamp paper, 300 rupees stamp paper. You know, it's um, uh, time consuming to get a stamp paper too. And then that also has to be attested. So there are so many things that need to be done. Um, and then there are other kinds of controls. For example, um, I hear of a project that was going up in the mountains and they had to get an NOC from the Coast Guard. And I hear, um, you know, so all kinds of stories that we hear. Is that not happening in India? Did you actually truly liberalize? Monte, go ahead. Well, um, no, I would say that, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, Am go I ahead. Audible? yeah. Very, very much. That's so. a huh. fascinating, uh, fascinating description of what uh, your bureaucrats did and the, uh, the NOC concept. Um, you know, I, I would say give the, give the bureaucrats a fair deal in India. By and large, they didn't actually fight against the liberalization. Now, one, one difference maybe is that, you know, a lot of the early liberalization was being driven from the center. And a lot of the sort of uh, uh, problems that businessmen face really are the level of state governments. And I don't have uh, a direct knowledge of exactly how things work at the state level. And frequently people tell me that there's a lot of variation across states, that in some states, uh, the message gets across, the local state administration works towards uh, faster clearances, in others it doesn't. I think at the center, the areas that we were uh, liberalizing, uh, they did actually get liberalized. Here and there, somebody may have raised an objection, but there's one, uh, a supplementary point I want to make to clarify something which uh, uh, Surjit said. I mean, Surjit said that uh, the 91 reforms, his big complaint about the 91 reforms is that they did nothing for agriculture. This is very frequently said, and I've always re responded to it by pointing out that this ignores the fact that getting rid of industrial protection and moving to a free exchange rate is the biggest thing we did for agriculture because you know protection on industry is a tax on agriculture so if you construct virtually any measure of what uh, the industrial protect protection reduction was it would become the mirror image of the positive effect on agriculture and that is actually why agricultural exports, as I think Ashok Gulati has pointed out, you know, with the new system where the exchange rate became a much more realistic measure of what uh, uh, the undistorted exchange rate should be, led to a much greater, better performance in exports in agriculture. And whichever exports you look at, I think we did quite well. So it's true that beyond that, in constitutionally in India, Agriculture is a state subject. So it's not the only thing the center can do is to start uh, some schemes or the other and provide some money. They did that. I agree with him, however, that the, the, the minimum support price has ended up uh, amounting to a distortion. It played a role uh, at a time when people thought we wouldn't be able to feed the country, it played an important role. It started off the green revolution in the Punjab, uh, but I think it went on for too long and somehow became too much a politicized issue. I mean, in I mean, he mentioned the fact that I was heading asked by uh, Amrinder Singh, Chief Minister of Punjab, to make a report on what we should recommend for Punjab. 
And one of the important things in it was agriculture. And we did indicate that we should liberalize. I mean, let the farmers sell to different people, etc. But somehow that didn't get managed well. Uh, I mean, our approach at that time was that this is constitutionally a state subject. So all our recommendations were addressed to the states. What happened with the farm laws was that the government obtained an interpretation that it doesn't have to be done only by the states. It can be done by the center. But somehow, perhaps the consultation that was necessary in making that change didn't happen. It got rapidly politicized and went out of control. And then the government withdrew the, withdrew the laws. So I think personally, uh, the right thing to do is to say, OK, we're not doing it in the center. But we strongly recommend every state government to pass these laws. And since the BJP controls many of the states, uh, it should be easy to do in those states. And if that leads to positive effects, it'll spill over automatically. That's my only uh, minor dispute with Sujit on something which otherwise we broadly agree on. Hmm. Sujit, what's your take on, on, the, on the regulatory stuff? Have we achieved liberalization? And add to that the question, how is it that India runs fiscal deficits almost on the same level as Pakistan? I know you've written about it and yet seems to get away with it, whereas we have these fiscal deficits and we end up into, into a fund program. Now, on regulations, um, you know, <clears throat> one of the, one we have done quite well in deregulating. Okay. Uh, the financial sector is one where I have been saying, in, including in in committee reports, etc., that we have a too stringent. Um, now it's becoming less meaningful, but where you know a foreign investor, um, like you, for example, Nadim, or anybody else, anybody outside of India cannot invest in the Indian stock market unless they go and pay a high premium to one of the international fund managers um, to manage their money. Why that is the case, I don't, I still don't know. Um, I think it's protection for the Morgan Stanleys of the world and for the Goldman Sachs of the world. And again, this is uh, not a transparent object, not a transparent regulation, but it really um, is there, is present. And I was, you know, mentioned it in the Capital Account Convertibility Committee of 99, uh, of 2006. And it doesn't matter what government is in power. Um, this is one reform like agriculture. Though, I, things are changing. So I think we, you know, I don't think our job is complete in terms of deregulation, but certainly you're seeing enormous benefits from deregulation across the board. And as it happens, you know, basically the, the governments have got to realize, and they are realizing this, that with this instrument that is there around the world in communication, you know, you don't, the governments do not have that much influence over events. Um, and therefore, they should not try and regulate. It'll get distorted or it'll get avoided, etc. So I think, um, you know, the bureaucrats are getting it, the policymakers are getting it. And that's the way forward in this world. So I think, you know, if I were, what is my hit list for um, reforms in India? Um, they are like Montex, I think. You know, they are not that many big items uh, deserving to be uh, deregulated or reformed. We have, you know, thanks to the pioneering work uh, of the 91 reforms, set in a climate and an acceptance of economic reforms. And the point is, they didn't set in the acceptance for the reforms. The people, I mean, that was the original argument of all of us advocating reforms, that the people would support it, would want it, because there will be benefits of economic reforms to the people at large. 
And that is why reforms have kept forward. The, the benefits have become apparent. And that is where they, you know, this is the big, once you initiate the process, once you start the process, the big, the big problem around the world in terms of economic reforms, how do you get, you know, the first one? Um, and, and, you know, take growth rates, for example, the first three years after the reforms, India grew at something like seven plus for three years in a row. Then the government lost in 96. Um, after having really uh, done extraordinarily well in terms of reforms, in terms of delivering growth, um, and that set in motion the thinking that, look, maybe reforms are not politically popular, uh, but what we have shown in India through various governments is that economic reforms are ultimately politically popular, and uh, that's the sweet spot of growth and reforms that India is in. Right. Let me bring in some people from the floor. Shahid Kardar, Shahid Kardar, former governor of the State Bank. Shahid, go ahead. I, I must confess, it, it really has been a great privilege uh, to hear and be educated on the Indian reforms from its key architects, uh, especially Dr. Um, Aluwalia, and of course, it's lovely to see and hear Sujit again, having interacted with him recently in Pakistan. And I, I hear them about continuity at the political level, but I, it's interesting that these two gentlemen also provided a continuity over a very long period. I mean, so it's not just continuity at the level of the, the, the governments doing so. I'm really just keen to understand just one point, which is, the political economy aspect of opening up uh, and the way it was handled. The uh, reason I, just to <laughs> remind ourselves, I hear about the political support and the lack of bureaucratic resistance to it. But India was, in my limited understanding, was much more controlled economy than the Pakistan case. So admittedly, as uh, Nadeem reminds us, based on the Pakistan experience, one would have expected uh, interest groups, okay, I hear uh, the political side and the bureaucratic side, and our minds were changing there. The interest groups, the losers, would have offered the kind of resistance, at least in the short term, to scuttle the process. Was the resistance really that weak? And if it was stiff, how was it really managed? And I'll just stop that and just really love to hear Mr. Aluwali and, of course, Sujit on this. Thank you. Well, that's a very, very interesting uh, and insightful kind of question. You know, uh, my sister, first of all, I'm not a political scientist. And I'm always fascinated when I look at a historical period written by political scientists because they bring in all kinds of factors that one is not really aware of. So this is an untutored kind of response. I think that one of the important uh, participants in the reform process was organized Indian industry, uh, represented by the CII. A lot of the top Indian industrialists uh, banded together originally when the reforms were introduced. They took the view that, look, uh, we can't be subjected to competition from abroad because there are so many other factors that burden us. But in the end, they liked the idea that government control over them would be removed. They would be free to expand. They would be able to bring in capital goods from wherever they wanted. Now, you know, the big losers in this were the Indian producers of capital goods who happened to be public sector guys. And they're not actually they're not prone to or capable of organizing. I mean, they just talk to the secretary concerned and they work within the system. But when you had a Rahul Bajaj and you had uh, Mukesh Ambani and others strongly in favor of liberalization because it enabled them to bring in technology and capital goods from wherever they wanted, then I think the fact that a few public sector companies uh, would not do well under those circumstances because they weren't re they weren't reinventing themselves uh, was easy to get to get over. 
I would say that by by the by the time the re reforms gained momentum, uh, Indian industry was solidly behind them because it could see that it has been hugely benefited. So you did you did have uh, you did have a pro reform uh, group in organized Indian industry. I think the other reason uh, uh, why there wasn't much opposition. Uh, and uh, is that, you know, the reservation policy for small scale industry was not effective. And this was a conscious political decision. Uh, the prime minister and others wanted to be able to say, we're subjecting the large guys to competitive pressures. You are not being thrown to the wolves. Now, personally, I think had you thrown them a little bit more to the wolves with a little bit of support, they would have done quite well. But I think that is one of the reasons why control over the small, smaller size manufacturers uh, was uh, finally lifted much, much later. You know, in thinking about, and all of us have been involved in thinking about reforms academically and otherwise, um, I think the movement was, I strongly believe, that uh, the forms are politically popular the and can be politically popular are politically popular uh, then why is it so difficult to bring about reforms um interest groups we've talked about and basically the conclusion is that the government has to take the role um, and whether you are a democratic government or non-democratic government, somebody up there has to say, listen, the system needs to change um, and enforce it, enforce it either uh, through a democratic process, you get elected and you advocate that, or you are in a non-democratic process and you still advocate. So I think, you know, there are very, very few countries now um, where this is maybe outside of North Korea, I don't know any, where the, the reform idea is not accepted. Um, back in the 70s and all, when we were graduate students, uh, maybe at that time, you know, there were big debates about import substitution and export pr promotion and, uh, you know, all these various models that we all looked at. Um, but, you know, it's now... I think what a almost I'm sort of hesitating, but it's almost a cookie cutter approach. Uh, you know who the interest groups are. You know um, where you know how to uh, tackle them, or you should know how to tackle them. Um, and you know, and I think one of the biggest, which is something that I am advocating, whether it's agriculture or whatever, one of the best examples of economic reform uh, was done by NAFTA in Mexico. Uh, Mexico had a big problem that they were big producers of corn and extremely inefficient producers of corn. And, you know, the one lesson that I want to give to whoever is listening. So how did they solve the problem? So NAFTA agreement was where U.S., Mexico and Canada got together and arranged an FTA, a free trade arrangement, North American Free Trade Association or whatever. Now, <clears throat> what was the element in the reform? You had to get the Mexicans out of producing corn. It's like getting Punjabis you know, out of producing wheat. Okay? Not all the Bengalis out of uh, producing rice. Not an easy task, and it's not sufficiently appreciated what was done. So what they did was they recognized the political problem. They recognized the economic problem that is highly inefficient production. And they then said that every Mexican farmer producing corn will get the equivalent of the last three years production or profits. We can go into the detail, but basically you will get a freebie. That is to say, you will get fully compensated for not growing corn. And you can then grow whatever else you want. And 
you know, and then the big thing was, and we were then at the World Bank and elsewhere uh, in the U.S. Remember the complaints? Oh, my God, they will consume alcohol or they will consume TV sets or they will do whatever. And what every what they found out was that 80 percent of this free money for not growing corn was invested. I mean, talk about a win, win, win situation. And that's what, whether it is climate policies in terms of coal or whatever, there's an easy solution. And, you know, it needs the willpower. And that is why I'm advocating the similar thing for, for in terms of India. But, you know, we need the, the, basically the world has enormously changed from when we were students. Um, there's so much knowledge in the world of what works and what doesn't work. And it's just now a straightforward process of application. Great. Zafar Masood, sir, CEO of Bank of Punjab. Thank you very much, Dr. Sir. Uh, thank you for uh, arranging this very enlightening talk. I must uh, appreciate the two gentlemen uh, for, uh, for their very insightful uh, uh, you know, discourse with us. Thank you, gentlemen. A um, couple of questions quickly. Uh, further, wanted to be uh, you know enlightened on a couple of items. One is, I, I completely appreciate and understand where you know the business community was coming through when you talk about free markets and um, and 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 opening up of the economy. But people in general, during the process of achieving that free uh, market benefits, the people in general suffer. And how did that society in general accepted this change and opening up of the economy, which in the interim was a bit of a challenge to, to, uh, uh, to tackle with. The second uh, uh, thing that I wanted to have a night, uh, uh, to have your, 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 um, uh, your thoughts on, uh, Montek ji uh, 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 said that, and, and completely agree with you, I just wanted that to be reinforced, that you know, while we go for liberalization, we need to take baby steps, move in, 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 uh, don't go overboard with these things. Uh, perhaps a balance is necessary. For example, you can't have a monetary policy, which is, which is totally liberalized, but you have completely Politburo uh, ideas and concepts on the fiscal side. That becomes more of a disaster than help at the end of the day. So on these two things, Looking forward to your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I? Uh, Nadeem, shall I? Yeah, I, I should mention that I've just received a message that I also have to leave for the airport to catch my flight to Delhi. Okay. So I think after this, answering this question, I will leave you all to the gentle mercies of Surjit. In the hands of Surjit. He can Surjit. answer on my behalf. He can also answer on my behalf saying, this is what Montague would have said, but I don't think he's right. And he <laughs> is right. You know, on, uh, on, on this right. issue of, I think one of the critical things, uh, doing things slowly. I mean, in a way, uh, Deng Xiaoping said it quite well, because when he said, you know, you've got to cross the river while feeling the stones. I always sort of think that there's a difference between tinkering and actually crossing the river while feeling the stones. Because crossing the river means you have a very clear sense of where you're going to get at. But you do it by looking at the way and sort of uh, maybe slightly changing your direction depending on what the stones are. Tinkering is just generally hanging around the, the riverbed and occasionally putting your toe in and then stepping out saying, no, oh, it's too cold, can't do it right now. And I think this is a balance that you have to judge uh, in each country, and it kind of varies. One of the points made by the speaker was that there's a perception that when you reform, uh, sure, business does well, but people suffer. Now, frankly, if that happens, you're not going to do well, and that shouldn't be happening. I would say in India, probably, where we, you might say we lucked out, is that the part of Indian industry that took the brunt of the liberalization, because the liberalization was not for consumer goods. You know, since we had allowed 
some of these small scale fellows to continue. We never liberalize consumer goods. We liberalize capital goods and intermediates. And these are produced by large units. The, the biggest thrust of the private sector was we can now import whatever capital goods we want. The guys who lost out on that were really the public sector capital goods producers, HMT, which probably doesn't even exist now, and, and others. And I think there, because they were public sector units, the fact that they may have done less well in terms of output didn't actually affect anybody's living because they weren't fired. So you had a, you know, you could actually, you could take steps that gave the public sector a lot more time to recover if it can without any suffering on the ground because nobody's actually fired. Uh, and it, I mean, if it, if it succeeds, well and good. If it doesn't, it gets privatized ultimately. That is what has happened to Air India. I mean, Air India was talked about being privatized for years. It's only got finally privatized last year. So it's a good example of uh, things that took a very long time. But during the period, it suffered from competition from others. Its market share went down. But it, it, it wasn't a case where people were being fired. So the system kept some of the public sector guys on the payroll, uh, adding to the losses of the company. Uh, I haven't thought this through uh, adequately, but it would be a nice bit of, bit of a study to do. Uh, what happened to the Indian public sector companies? I mean, some of these were quite big companies, you know, Hindustan Steel, for example, which used to set up uh, steel plants, gone. HMT, similarly gone. Uh, Air India now privatized after many years. I think, Sujit, you should get, you should do a study, a sort of case study of uh, the, the PSUs of yesteryear and what happened to them. And that would be very useful. It will stimulate a lot of thinking. So, with those words, thank you very much for thank arranging you, this. Thank you, It's been great thank fun you for, for me. being with us. Thank you for being with us. And one day we must get you to come to Pakistan, despite all the differences. Well, yes, I look forward to that. Thank we'll you. We'll bring you over, inshallah. Thank Bye. you. Bye -bye. I can Please highly recommend. Hello? Uh, Ji. Uh, go ahead, Sujit. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, on, on this thing, on... Um, and I guess this is to continue what Montek was saying on the PSUs of yesteryears. Um, there was a study done in 99 um, where you looked at the turnover in the top 30 companies, the, the Sensex, um, and how it had changed hands um, from 1980 to 99. And and the remarkable thing was it had changed hands. And basically, the large private sector, which was, you know, the government tried to regulate it, tried to control it, etc. Notwithstanding, so once it opened up, it further accelerated. So the point I'm trying to make is that private sector should be allowed to perform with incentives. And that will provide a correction to the public sector. So in other words, the public sector will face higher losses um, and which are, uh, you know, bureaucratically controlled. That uh, remember that the public sector exists because they have uh, no taxation and freebies and losses to cover uh, by your friendly government. So I think the atmosphere has to be there that really the private sector is a savior for the economy um, and then provide all the incentives while you're bringing down the entire structure of the public sector. Great. Thank you. Shahid? Shahid? Ji, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, th thank you for this. Very wonderful uh, presentation, Surjit Saab and uh, Montek Saab. Montek Saab, unfortunately, isn't here. Um, I'm sorry, there are a few noises in the background. But anyway, I, ho I hope you can hear my questions. So I just have a few uh, uh, short questions. So what I take from uh, the, your talk and uh, Montek Saab's talk is that 
you would uh, ad advocate a kind of slow going approach in terms of reforms rather than the what we say the shock therapy or the cold turkey approach which uh, friedman once termed it as a cold turkey the shock shock therapy approach mm -hmm. uh, am i right in suggesting that it should be what, that is what you uh, both of you have suggested the second um, thing you said something about a uh, very interesting you said uh, mentioned the public distribution system the pds now um, i don't i'm not very uh, uh, informed about india but in pakistan we run a, we've been running a huge uh, re distribution redistribution system through the government through various instruments but there as you mentioned and very rightly there were a lot of leakages there are a lot of leakages over here too so how do you view this public publicly led redistribution system how uh, should it be there should it be there in any particular form so how do you uh, it should should it be a centralized uh, or should it be central driven provincial or at the union council level uh, which is the lower uh, tier of uh, redistribution and last but not the least since you mentioned uh, surjit saab you mentioned something about agriculture now a few years ago there were huge protest protest uh, protests especially in uh, indian punjab by the farmers over uh, some regulation concerning commercial agriculture so what what's your view on that one thank you okay. yeah very good set of uh, questions and uh, let me answer uh not necessarily in the order that you asked but first uh, to clarify um i don't think and i'm not speaking for montek but i think uh, we both he and i are on the same page it's not that this, the 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 package has to be baby steps you obviously if you do it and that's the difference between marginally between tinkerization and baby steps um you have to have a overall goal and you have to have a little bit of a break from the past so it you know big bang has got a, a bad connotation a bad impression but it has to be some structure package that makes a dent and a significant dent in business as usual so i not so i can speak for myself very confidently i'm not for uh dheere dheere karna baby steps ka lo ye wo no have a vision have a goal and that is how i think what the 91 reforms have happened and the 2014 onwards reforms in terms of redistribution which i'll come to and growth uh so not at all that it has to be baby steps but it has to be significant baby steps step by step so got, if you know, okay then in terms of leakages and this is where all of us are now in a position to implement policy with minimum leakage um leakage is any time you introduce a distortion or subsidy or whatever there will be leakage that's human nature uh one you know even in the us <clears throat> where the taxation system is quite pronounced and deep that uh, only 82% of those people who should pay taxes actually pay taxes okay whereas in india in 2004 that number was close to 13% 13 it's now gone up so the point i'm wanting to make is that leakages will always be there so let's accept the leakage what you want to do is to keep it to a bare minimum uh or, you know the and i think that is the difference between the policy now of redistribution of pds versus before another let's look at why the objection um to the um agricultural uh, policy of uh, the forms of if you will allowing the farmers to to grow what they wanted to sell who they wanted at a price that they would get that was basically what the the form package was on agriculture okay now <clears throat> and then over time it would be the decrease the fertilizer subsidy and so on so forth so basically 
Athiyas, they are these small middlemen, small in number, who are getting enormous amounts of profits from basically buying from the farmer and selling to the government. What makes it doubling? So they were the ones who were opposed. There were 30,000 such farmers in Punjab and UP and Haryana. Okay, they control the whole, the middlemen. This is the very corrupt middlemen, whatever you want to call it. So this is something that the political organization, etc., just could not tackle. Um, and again, I would apply the Mexican model to them. Okay, you go, this is how much you were making for the last 10 years. Here, it's yours. Okay, and now we let the farmer sell to whoever he or she wants to sell it to. Uh, I'm actually proposing this model in mind. So that is what happened as far as the Althias. The small, you know, uh, we didn't do it. Last point, do not do it. In, you know, uh, Nadeem will tell you this a thousand times. I will tell you, do not do anything through the price system. So in other words, you want to redistribute. You know, a direct benefit transfer with it or job be in kind with it though. But don't try and do it through wages or don't try and do it through the price of a good. You want, this is, you know, all the countries of the, around the world will have now have technology, have knowledge. Technology also means knowledge and delivery. You have, will have to redistribute. We, I can't imagine a country ever over the last 20,000 years and the next 20,000 years that will not redistribute. So both are hey hey. So the, how you do it is do not do it through the price system. Do not do it through wages. Do it through the fiscal side. Here it is money. And the most preferred way is to make it very transparent and cash transfers, not even in kind. Because in kind has hidden distortions in it. But in you know if it's cash transfers, X is getting so much money, simple, everybody knows, and go ahead with that. So I think those are, you know, be transparent, use technology to the maximum extent, and, uh, you know, buy off the interest groups, as in the PDS case, or in the agricultural case. So did a couple of house cleaning questions. Yeah. Um, Montek mentioned systemic changes that Rajiv wanted to make. Do you have any idea what these systemic changes were? Or what would you, let me change it slightly different. Uh, what, would I think? Up, what would you, what are the systemic changes you would like to make today for India to really take off? Well, we have taken off, but no, but I, 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 I get your... Okay. Level out, level out. How, do, how can you accelerate, you know, I think, look, as, as Montague explained it very well, we've had very different sets of government. Um, the systemic changes in the legal system, um, you know, courts take a hell of a long time to adjudicate uh, anything. So, but I, I imagine that's not what Rajiv Gandhi, but let me say, you know, a lot of what he would have thought of has happened. So now let's think of what are the future challenges. Okay, legal cases. We have now with artificial intelligence, etc. Why can't, you know, why can't, and this happened during COVID times, that cases, you, person didn't have to come to the court. You had video hearings like we are having right now, and a court case got decided. Think of the time it takes for everybody to decide on, you know, you have to go there. Uh, transportation is difficult. There's traffic jams. There's time. As you know, you come from Chicago. I mean, time is money. So I think this is one reform that all countries need to do in order to both serve, be more transparent in terms of, and decrease. We all have an overload. Because the justice system in our countries is not exactly uh, very transparent, let's put it that way. 
And I think a lot of reform is needed uh, in terms of uh, just, <coughs> you know, uh, and I can go into my personal, <coughs> excuse me, uh, just to give you an example. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, you know, it taken me nine years to my father in 1991 in his will. And this is the systemic changes that my father didn't think about. I wanted to leave something to his grandchildren. So he said these stocks that he had would be left to his grandchildren. Okay. My father passed away in 98. In 2016, I had to go to the courts in order for the probate to be done, this, that, whatever. It just got settled two weeks ago. <laughs> okay. Thank in between, you. in between the, so there are thousands of such cases. Who benefits from this? The corporates, the guys whose stocks you have, because it goes into some investor fund. They don't have to pay the dividends, whatever. Anyway, so I think nine years to get a simple probate, when all the evidence is there, the will is there, then I'll, I'll give you this example, and I'm sure it happens the same in Pakistan. They said, how do we know that the witnesses are dead or alive? Okay. So then you have to bring, so <clears throat> then you've got to go find out whether they're dead or alive. Then if they're alive, they have to be brought. So I think, look, use technology <clears throat> and, you know, I think uh, have competition. Uh, that should be music to your ears. Um, essential element of checks and balances is competition. So let's not give competition by a bad name by saying, Hi, Rama, Madhga, inequality, Badga, uh, The point is, inequality, Badga, there are way other methods to solve it. Don't mess with the price system, you know, um, and do the redistribution. That's what. I'm a big advocate of, of redistribution, uh, but do it efficiently. You will have to do it. All societies have to do it. But everything, you know, I, I hope you remember my, you know, I, uh, this was uh, way back about 25 years ago or so that I coined the term Bismil Muflis. Right, right. I Again, remember. in the name of the poor. I remember. This was... This was a rallying cry for every politician. You say, Bismillah yeah. Muflis. So I think we need to. Now it's very difficult for politicians to uh, say that uh, these things are happening. So I think the world has become better uh, and uh, people have more knowledge. And so I, you know, maybe I come out as a starry eyed optimist, but you know. Reality has shown for developing countries, for the poor in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in Latin America, that they are significantly, significantly better off now than they were before. That doesn't mean nothing more needs to be done. And we've called the, the societies have called the bluff of the politicians because uh, they can't do that anymore. Last question, Nadeem, sir. Nadeem. I'm a student of economics and I'm very pleased to hear your talks. And I, uh, I also uh, uh, read, the, uh, read about the Indian economic reforms from a website. It is on the project 1991. So my question to you is that there is a perception that some of the powerful groups who are the beneficiaries of this disrupt have a significant access in policy or power corridors in Pakistan, and therefore the reforms are not happening the way they should have. How do you see this politic in the light of political economic literature and seeing like India in 1990 versus Pakistan in today, this power corridor group argument or anything else like that, which sometimes is also called as elite capture or given some other terms. Thank you so much. No, very good question, Nadeem Saab. And, you know, first, the power corridor, or the power culture or whatever, that will always be with us, whether you are in US, 
whether you are in India, whether you are in Pakistan, this is a, a fact of life. So what you have to do is to try and uh, call their, you know, basically monopoly. That's why you have antitrust legislation even in the U.S., um, I think now, for example, um, not for example, but Facebook and Google has extraordinary amount of uh, influence and uh, monopoly. Uh, so therefore, you have to be concerned that, listen, monopoly has a price and the people pay for that price. So you want to try. That's why you have antitrust legislation and try and enforce it. But you cannot ever eliminate it. There will always be a case where somebody... So in the case now of whether it's Pakistan or India, um, and Montek had mentioned the case of the Lions and the other powerful industrial groups. And, you know, I can't think of um, a country where there won't be uh, in powerful industrial groups. But how do they grow? How do, you, how do you tackle that problem? That's not a problem, first of all, to have powerful industrial groups. That's how... Every innovation can happen, technological change can happen. What is a problem is when they influence policy to go against the public interest. And that is what you need to do. So you want to, they, they, they will exist. No point fighting that they are there. But if they influence policy, that is where, and there's a classic example of 1984, I believe, that the government was bringing in taxation on imports uh, and uh, textile imports. And the Alliance was the major, major beneficiary because they were going to increase the, the tax rates on that. And basically, they were allowed to import something in the midnight to, to do whatever. So all I'm saying is, that there is a genuine, the politicians get influenced by powerful industrial groups. And that's what you, uh, another thing that you want to minimize. You will not be able to eliminate, but minimize. So I think uh, the fight has to be to uh, basically advocate as much transparency as possible. And that's happening in, in the US now where Senators were bought stocks uh, from Pelosi, etc. You have, and now they're trying to put restrictions on how they can do so. You know, it's natural for the interest groups to, uh, or powerful industrial groups or anybody else to influence uh, their profits. And it's the job of academics, of policymakers, and civil society to make it transparent that this is what is happening and therefore bring about change. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't be, but you know, it is our responsibility as civil society, as academics, um, to really call the bluff and expose uh, what's happening. And then policy will take its course, correct course. Again, part of my optimism. Sujit, so, we have to end, but before I end, I mean, you know, it's getting late, but nevertheless, I have to use this occasion to ask you a couple of questions which are very important. So, quick reactions. One is, you've been, uh, you know, you've done some great econometric work uh, trying to distinguish between various hypotheses and theses, etc. So, one question that I'd like to run in your mind very quickly is, um, what if I told you that the narrow reform, which is the land reform, basically, which there's a lot of story about land reform, land reform, and then the, the, the making of the IITs. Um, and then also, the, the related issue is that somehow the Indian economists have more of a say, even though it went the wrong way the first time with Mahalanobis, etc. Somehow, Indian economists have had more of a say in their policy making than, let's say, in Pakistan. In Pakistan, our economists are totally uh, out of the loop. So how do you see these things? That if Can we set up an experiment somehow to see whether it's the land reform of Nehru and the, those, those two or three things that led to the reform, that, sorry, has led to this growth, or is it just those 91 reforms? Okay. Uh, no. Can you think there's, about that? 
There are several questions embedded in the two or three questions that you have asked. Yeah. Yeah. But let's just take the land reform side. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, do two of the forms that uh, Nehru did, um, <clears throat> and maybe by illustrating, um, it will help uh, answer the question. The one was land reform. First of all, it was, so let's call it land reform. It may not be as complete as you and I would want it if it was to happen. Um, let me put it, I'm not a big fan of land reform. Okay. Uh, but something else that Nehru did, um, and that will illustrate, which he's given a lot of credit for, they look at the software revolution in India and they say, listen, he started the IITs, right? Exactly. Now, my exactly. constant answer to that, listen, he should have done primary and secondary education first. You have some college, etc. There's a natural evolution process, in my view, that will take place. You do that. That's a, what allowed China to grow. Once it did, took out the bureaucratic and other controls, once they opened up the economy, um, this is why they grew much faster than we did. But has, Nehru, allowed, not been, has Nehru not been vindicated? I mean, the, uh, the IIT revolution left I, the Not in my box. Not in my books. Okay. So I think, uh, you know, the, I mean, I really don't think that, uh, and that's a good study to do, actually. And maybe you and I can collaborate. Did the experiment of delaying primary and secondary education at the expense of having IITs has, actually, that's a, a good study to do. I'll give you my prior. And my prior is that it was a big mistake. Uh, to do that and had precious little to do with the software revolution in India and the rest of it. Um, so, uh, but that's, you know, one other mistake, you know, advantage that India has, um, which Pakistan doesn't and very few countries in the world, is population, the size. So even if you're doing... 2% engineers in a world economy, that, that's a lot. So I think um, that has a lot to do with the success of both India and China is their respective size, which gives them an internal market, which means, you know, if you take uh, the number of billionaires, etc., whatever you want to think of, scale helps. Um, so, so, to answer your question, uh, land reform, I not in my book is such a great thing that I don't think you know it was. There's empirical evidence to suggest that it did. Matter of fact, it led to here's one. It led to the um, the the breakup of various farm size. You know the whole farm size productivity debate. Small farms are more productive. And then if you will, you know, which Amitya Sen and all of them, and that would have been an argument for, or is an argument for land reform. Now, basically they're being distorted further and further or uh, becoming smaller and smaller sizes. And as I showed in a paper with Pranoy, uh, your good friend and mine, where, yeah. you know, it was land quality that made farm sizes, yeah. small farms yeah. more productive than, so I think, uh, no, both studies are worth doing, Nadeem. I, uh, land reform didn't help. Maybe my leftist friends and your leftist friends will hate us for that. Uh, and I think, which everybody will hate me for, is I don't think the policy of uh, I starting IITs was such a big story. Sujit, so, thank you. It's always a pleasure talking to you. We must continue this series of India-Pakistan um, talks. Absolutely. I'll rely on you to give me more speakers and you come frequently and we'll inshallah make on our level at least a bit of a difference even if we can't hack the whole political spectrum. My thanks to both you and Spectrum. I think everybody in Pakistan enjoyed it. Thank you again. All the best for that. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks.